Our topic today is how religious dogmas might injure, inhibit, or arrest our critical thinking facilities. Before I begin, I've reached the point now where I've made several video clips, and sometimes I want to refer back to one. It's as if in a previous clip I talked about point A and B and then went to point C, and now maybe I want to revisit point A and B so I can go to point D. So I will revisit some points I made in previous clips, but I'll just briefly cover them. So, for instance, I'm going to revisit something in this clip. If you want to see the full story, just look at this one. Now, in this uh, video clip, I mentioned how in Catholic school, when I was there, I was taught that an unforgiven mortal sin could send you to hell forever. You could commit a mortal sin when you reached the age of reason, which was seven years old. Back then, intentionally eating meat on Friday was a mortal sin. Today, as far as I know, missing Mass on Sunday is a mortal sin, and using contraception is a mortal sin. So, technically, this next picture is inaccurate because babies went to limbo, but an eight-year-old little boy or girl in second grade or whatever could conceivably end up in hell forever by what I was taught. They, um, at a baseball game, they know it's Friday. They, with full knowledge that it's a mortal sin, decide, I'll have this hot dog, I'll go to confession tomorrow. They die suddenly without the chance of repentance. They're in hell forever. That was the teaching back then. Today, you can apply it to any other thing that's still a mortal sin. Now, what are you supposed to do with something like that, a thought like that, when you're a kid? Well, if you think about it, I think you'd naturally feel, if, if your critical facilities were developed, that are developing, that it's wrong. Is God really like that? Another thing I spoke about in the How to Make a Scripture, there were a few things from this one. One was that Noah's Ark is, I've seen it presented as a wonderful story of God saving Noah's family and all those cute little animals. It's really a horrible story. Every man, woman, child, senior citizen, infant, furry rabbit, puppy dog, little kitten, drowns slowly. Aside from the people in the ark and the animals on the ark. That's not a very nice story. I also discussed the, the, garden, of, uh, the garden of Adam uh, of Eden with Adam and Eve story too in that clip. And I kind of suggested that possibly those elements of scripture serve to turn off our critical f facilities, to make us not question. Because certainly if you question in your young child, it's going to be possibly very severe. You know, the, the, the religious teachers will tell you you're, well, maybe they'll try to give you an explanation. But if you persist in saying you think it's wrong, it's going, they're going to go very hard on you. So maybe those elements serve to teach you at a young age, you've got to just accept, or even if you don't accept, don't question, don't question openly. Now, I'm going to apply, I'm going to make a point about the Lord's Prayer along these lines, but I'm going to discuss the whole Lord's Prayer. Now, in Catholic school, that last line wasn't there, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, but if God is our Father, I've got nothing to say about that, okay, his is the kingdom, the power and the glory, fine. So, even if it was there, I wouldn't have much to say about it. Now, the first line, Our Father. Okay, I, I talked in this clip, by it would be natural to think of God as Father or as Parent rather than as ultimate ground of existence. I mentioned the child's hierarchy. I mentioned how a child has naturally sees matter as dumb, you know, like the, the chair or the desk. But then we, the, move, the child moves on to maybe dolls, like have personality. But they, pretend the doll has personality, that animals and children and adults, and then adults have power and knowledge, but then there's God who's the super parent, who has all the power and all the knowledge. That's a natural way that a child would develop the idea of God as a father. Why not a mother? I don't know. Who aren't in heaven. Now this emphasizes the idea of God as transcending the natural world. God is there, not here. God is in heaven. And I mentioned how there's different ways to think about God. I've mentioned this in several clips, and how a transcendent God is above and beyond the universe, where an imminent God is in the universe. 
So the Lord's Prayer is teaching us there that God is not here, but there. Also the Apostles' Creed, Creator. When I create a, a table, I'm separate from the table. So in this way, it emphasizes the idea that God is separate from the universe. God is not imminent in the universe, but transcends the universe. Hallowed be thy name. Now this name, the Bible has some odd uh, usages of name. For instance, well, first of all, if God's name is, is holy, then we can't, I mean, it is what it is. And what does hallowed be thy name mean? Are we saying, oh, well, we hope your name is holy? We don't know. I mean, it, but also there's this famous prophecy of behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which logically Jesus is what we call the man. Is Emmanuel what we call the name Jesus rather than the man? It, it's kind of a, a little odd logical thing there. But more importantly, this refers to the Lord has said through the prophet refers to Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. By the time he knows enough to reject evil and good. You mean Jesus, there was a time before he knew to reject evil and good? That's strange. But what's stranger is that this, there's the good case be made, a good case can be made that this is a mistranslation, that the most famous prophecy in the Bible is not a prophecy at all. The idea is that the Hebrew word meant young woman. It didn't mean virgin. And the verb was has conceived. A young woman has conceived. Now, Matthew decided that the verse should say a virgin will conceive. There was some support for that. The Hebrew had been translated in the Greek and the Greek word could mean virgin, although it could mean maiden too. So it was kind of a stretch to see this as a prophecy. Even in the Greek, the word didn't have to mean virgin. Matthew made it a prophecy. Now you can investigate this as much as you want, but it's very, a very strong case could be made that this is no prophecy at all. And Matthew made it into one. Okay, thy kingdom come. Again, emphasizes this isn't God's kingdom. The God is in heaven. God's kingdom is up there, down here on earth. God is kind of not present. And there again, it emphasizes God transcends the world, the universe. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that's a nice sentiment, but it would have been nice if God had made his will more clearly known. For, for several centuries, it was believed that God's will included torture and then burn, which is the death. Then they decided, well, maybe that's not God's will. That's at least what we think today. For centuries, people in the south of the United States, also in the north, and also I've read once that the Pope had slaves, but I, don't, I, I didn't verify that. But anyway, at least in the south of the United States, people for centuries believed that God's will was, it's okay to buy and sell human beings. Then after a terrible war, they thought, well, maybe he doesn't mean that. Now, in the Old Testament, there are many places that say, if a child curses a parent, that child should be put to death. And Jesus in the New Testament, this is Jesus speaking, cites that law with approval. For God said, anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. I don't think that's really God's will. So thy will be done is a nice sentiment, but you have to know what God's will is. And it'd be nice if, uh, if the writing, supposedly writing all these revelations, or if you just consider the Bible a revelation, it's, it's a large book. And it would be nice if it had if it more explicitly and clearly told us what God's will is. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, that's, that's nice. I mean, I, I appreciate having food. Uh, if God is our Father, I shouldn't have to ask, I guess, but there's no problem with asking. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, the next line phrase is the one I like the best. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive who trespass against us. Show us the same mercy that we show others. I think that's the best line in the whole prayer, and I like it. I, I think it's it's a very nice line. But now we get to the point of this video clip, arresting critical thought. Here's the line, and lead us not into temptation. Well, does God ever tempt people? You would think no, because here's James, no one should say God is tempting me, because God does not tempt anyone. Well, why does Jesus ask us to pray to God not to tempt us, even though does God tempt us? Isn't that the devil's job? Now, I know this line has been changed. I've heard it 
rendered as, and we're just not in the hard testing. That's fine. But my point is that when I was young, I probably repeated the Lord's Prayer thousands of times. If you went to confession, you might have a penance of, say, three Our Fathers and three Hail Marys. It was repeated in Mass. It was repeated so many times. So maybe someone who wasn't paying attention wouldn't understand the dogma of hell for a mortal sin, but they certainly knew the Lord's Prayer. And what did they think when they got to this line? Now, I, I was about 30 when I read a book. It was by a Hindu religious teacher, by the way, and he was explaining what this line meant in his theology. But what struck me was I had never wondered, at least I never remembered wondering about this line. And uh, a few people I've spoken to over the years, I asked them, what did you think of this line? And they never, it just never occurred to them to think about what they were saying. And that's a very odd thing. It's like um, there's a similar uh, thing. In the United States, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Now, by the way, this is really the oath of allegiance, I think, and there's an explicit command in the New Testament where Jesus says, don't take oaths, but that's a whole other story. The point is that I once heard a story about a little boy who was repeating this Pledge of Allegiance, but he was saying, and to the Republic for which for Richard stands, and someone was amused, and they said, who's Richard stands? And he said, I don't know. He was just repeating it. And it's okay, I guess, for a young child to not understand things, but how could adults repeat the Lord's Prayer over and over again and never wonder? Well, that's my point. Does religion turn off your critical faculties? Does it dull them? Does it arrest them? I'll finish by saying, and deliver us from evil. Well, if that's fine, and amen. And that's really all I have to say. That I think that religions sometimes have such bizarre beliefs because that makes you, that teaches you, don't question, don't think too hard, just follow, just believe. But we're doing just the opposite in this series. We're examining, we're thinking critically, and we're not afraid to, um, I'm not afraid to criticize something I think is wrong. I did want to add one more thing. My first recollection of the Mass, it was still in Latin. And I was taken to Mass when I was probably six or seven. And I didn't like it because I didn't understand that the priest was up there talking in Latin. And sometimes the people would respond, and they'd respond that struck me in a very dull, doped like way. Uh, or, you know, kind of like a murmur, like a... I mean, I was used to adults being... Well, adults would... Well, when they'd see me, hello, Artie, how you doing? You know, real cheerful, okay. But then when they'd talk to other adults, maybe more subdued, but in mass, they seemed to be half conscious. And there was this thing they'd say, you know, like a murmur. And after about the third, fourth time I went to mass, I realized they were speaking in English. I believe they were saying the Lord's Prayer, if I remember correctly. But they were saying it in such a murmured way. Now, some people might think that that sound is reverent and that sound is um, somehow deep and spiritual. But as a child, my first encounter with, I guess, Catholicism, or one of my first encounters with the Catholic Mass, did not impress me favorably, just because the people around me seemed so unconscious. And when they responded, they didn't speak clearly. It was kind of an unconscious murmur. Um, anyway, that's the way it struck me, and I thought it was germane, so I would add it to this video.